All right, you should be in Joel. So I'm going to just read the first verse and then we will pray. The first verse in Joel. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we, we don't have to add anything to it, um, that it's so relevant to our lives. We pray that you may speak to us where we are right now um, as we, we open up your word, as we expound it, Lord, as we, we first of all interpret it in its historical context. Secondly, Lord, as we draw out principles for living it out, of, out of the book. And then thirdly, Lord, as we apply those principles to our lives, which may look slightly different in some respects, but uh, those principles stay the same. So, Lord, we just pray that you may teach us much. Amen. Today's sermon may be slightly longer than normal. Um, I, I did my best to keep this as brief as possible. But as, as Matthew read the book, you can see there's a lot of content there. This is a book rich in content. And that's why I'm going to keep introductory comments really to a minimum. There's a lot in this book, even though we are only doing a surface level study. Um, you may have questions after this, um, but that's because we aren't going into great detail. And it's relevant to our, our, our current situation, especially considering the pandemic, um, as we, uh, you'll, you'll see the correlation soon. So this evening, I'm going to just jump straight into verse 1 and allow the book to speak for itself. Let's do that now. Under our first heading, which is, Who and when? And this is in verse, chapter 1, verse 1. So, who wrote this prophecy? According to verse 1, and we, it, it's Joel. And we know nothing about him. Uh, unlike many of the other Old Testament prophets. So, it's not really worth trying to figure out details about him. This is the author. And when did he write this prophecy? This is also unknown. But we do know a few things about this. This was written directly after a locust plague. At a point in Israel's history when the temple was in use, you can see that in chapter 1 verse 9, and at a point in their history when the elders and priests seemed to have more political power than the king, which could indicate a dating during uh, young King Joash's reign in the early stages when he was still a child. He became a king at seven, and uh, the priests really ruled the nation and the elders. And you can see, see that this letter addresses the, the elders and the priests more so than a king. You can see that in chapter 1, verse 2 and 13. This is probably one of the hardest books to date in the entire Old Testament. And that may be because God actually wanted his people to read this book whenever a crisis struck. That means that we can do the same thing right now. As we find ourselves in the midst of this pandemic that has turned our world upside down, Let's now see which crisis led to this prophecy. A, under the heading, a present crisis, and we're going to look at verses, chapter 1, verse 2, and we're going to move to verse 12. So what we have in verses 2 to 4, let's start there, is God addressing the elders of Judah, those who have the most political power at the time. God saying, what's just happened to the nation is catastrophic. It's the kind of crisis that so shook the entire nation that those that lived through it would tell their children about it. Like that grandparent that regularly tells you stories, um, to, stories to their grandchildren or their children of what life was like during World War II. Like the grandparent that, that tells stories to the children 
of what it was like to live through apartheid. This was catastrophic. And those that lived through it, years later, people are still reading about it and saying, what must it have been like to live then? And they say, I lived through it. I'll tell you what it's like. What's the crisis that Judah experienced? A locust plague, according to verse 4. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust has left, the destroying locust has eaten. Basically, a whole bunch of locusts came by, and they ate a whole bunch of stuff, but they left something, But then a whole bunch of other locusts came and ate them too. And they left a little bit. Maybe they still have, no, here comes more locusts. If we had to describe what just happened in a modern context, it would be like an older couple who invested diligently over the years so that they could retire well, losing all that money due to a stock market crash or the realization that they had invested into a pyramid scheme. That happens to a lot of people. This could also describe the person who goes into their very comfy job one morning, only to be kicked out of the office with the revelation that the company hasn't paid rent for the entire year, that the company's millions in debt to SARS, and then salaries suddenly stop getting paid. Does that sound unrealistic? It happened to my wife. This is the kind of catastrophe we're talking about. What I'm trying to get across is that this locust plague equaled financial disaster for the people of Judah. This was traumatic. In verses 5 to 7, God addresses the drunkards, those who suffer during this, the drunkards, who tend to deal with their problems by forgetting about them. Because when you passed out, it's pretty difficult to be worried. Well, this locust plague took away that option for them. Because the locusts destroyed the grapevines. Maybe that's why so many South Africans were so upset about the alcohol ban. Because they were deprived of their greatest source of comfort. One runs to their idols when the going gets tough. Let's go to verses 8 to 10, where God addresses the religious leaders of Judah, who are mourning because they've been deprived of their means of worship. According to verse 9, the grain offering and the drink offering were cut off from the house of the Lord. This judgment even affected the way God's people worshipped. Whatever your opinion about the government's handling of religious gatherings, it's impossible to deny that this pandemic has had a major impact on how we worship. It's revealed a lot of people that were religious, but they, they didn't really have a commitment to the Lord. And some have taken this as a, an excuse to disappear off the sea. As church leaders, we, we ask you to pray for us, to react wisely to this pandemic. So we could be faithful in our calling to be good citizens, while at the same time showing that the church is, in fact, essential. That requires a lot of wisdom. Then in verses 11 to 12, we have God addressing the farmers of Judah. God tells them to mourn, because this year the harvest is going to be non-existent. Do you know what that means? They're getting famine. Judah wouldn't even have the most basic of needs. Forget not having DSTV or internet. They won't have food. So how did God expect his people to react to this national catastrophe? The answer to this question is in the next section of the book. 
under our heading, the response God desired. This is in ver- chapter 1, verse 13 to 20. How did God is- expect his people to react to this tragedy? By gathering together and pleading with him to deliver them, according to verses 13 to 14. God is calling his people to humble themselves and beg God for deliverance from their circumstances. Which we know because God commands the religious leaders to put on sackcloth and lament. Now this certainly implies a call to repentance. Because we know this because When Nineveh repented in Jonah chapter 3, they put on sackcloth and begged God for mercy. But this aspect of repentance will come out more strongly in chapter 2. That's not the main emphasis in this section. The main emphasis in this section is, who are you going to call on when the going gets tough? Who are you going to put your faith in, your trust in? In verses 15 to 18, we see God warning his people of a day of impending doom. God calls this day of impending doom the day of the Lord. In verse 15, we see that this day of the Lord is described as a day of destruction. As we progress in the book, the day of the Lord will be referred to regularly. This is a major theme of the book. It is the major theme of the book, as Matthew mentioned. And we'll observe different aspects of the day of the Lord. We see in verse 15 that the day of the Lord is when God comes in judgment. God is using this locust plague, the effects of it described in verses 16 to 18, to remind his people of a future coming judgment. How were God's people to respond to the terrifying reality of this locust plague? How are we to react to the reality of this pandemic? By crying out to the Lord for deliverance, as we see in verses 19 to 20. How do we apply this, brothers and sisters in Christ? When trouble When troubles come, how long does it take you to turn to the Lord? Primarily, think about it in prayer. Do you turn to the Lord first when trouble strikes? Or do you first turn to your family, your bank balance, your ability to just grit your teeth and do something? Some people just decide to believe it didn't happen and delude themselves. Some people run to escapism. That's just a few things we could run to. You know what? God doesn't want that. God wants to be the first port of call when trouble strikes. He doesn't want to merely be a last resort. But what would this coming day of the Lord look like? This is answered for us in the next section of the book. And we'll look at it now under the heading, The Future and More Terrifying Crisis. And this is in chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. So, if you thought a locust plague that led to famine sounds bad, what if I told you that things were going to get worse? What we have in chapters 1 to 2, to chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, is Joel turning up the heat, literally. They speak of fire coming before this army and behind it. The day of the Lord will be marked by an invading army, described using the imagery of the locust plague. Just listen to verses 1D to 3, the last bit of chapter 1 to to 3. The day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Maybe it's all the flames going that puts this cloud of darkness. Like blackness there is, is spread upon the mountains. 
a great and powerful people. There, like, a, let me just repeat that. A great and powerful people. There, like, has never been before, nor will be again after them. Through the years of all generations, fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like a garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. This is descriptive of an army that would invade Israel, an army of such skill and discipline that nobody could defy it. Or it's descriptive of an angelic army coming in judgment. It's very difficult to tell. Maybe it's both. I'm more partial to the second interpretation based on chapter 2 verse 11. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? If you're sitting here or listening to this and you don't know Jesus, Jesus is coming in judgment. And this pandemic will seem like a dream holiday compared to that judgment. One of God's purposes in sending catastrophes, as I said earlier, like this pandemic, is to remind us that future judgment is coming. That we are power and, and also that we are powerless to face it. These kinds of judgments remind us, you know what, you've wronged God. They remind you that you're a sinner. And it reminds you of your inability to resist the judgment that's coming your way. And of the fact that you desperately need to be saved, not by yourself, because you can't save yourself. You're powerless to save yourself. You need somebody else to save you. That's why you call on the Lord when the going gets tough. Let's see the response that God wanted to encourage by, re by revealing this impending doom in the next section. The book moves on in, in chapter 2, verse 12 to 17, with the heading, The Response God Desired. This is the second response with the emphasis on repentance. In verse 12 to 17, God tells the people of Israel to repent of their sins, to beg for mercy, and then he may be merciful by not giving Israel the judgment that they deserved. Just listen to verses 12 to 14. Yet even now, yet even now, there's still hope for you, declares the Lord. Return to me with all your heart. Israel, Israel's commitment to God had wavered. With fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. This is clearly describing genuine repentance from sin and not merely an attempt to pander to God, to appease God. Rend your hearts, not just your garments. Don't just do a religious thing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Like he did when he chose not to punish Nineveh because they repented of their sins. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? Because if he didn't, we'd only be getting what we deserved and leave a blessing behind him. What hope do we have to be spared of the coming judgment? Our only hope is that Jesus saves us by taking the punishment we deserve in our place. You can see that in Romans 3, verse 21 to 26. It's called a propitiation. And the only way to have Jesus take that punishment in our place is to beg him to do that for us and by trusting him to save us from our deserved judgment. This is what it means to repent of our sins and to put our faith in Jesus. That's what it means. What will be the re results of this repentance? The prophet 
discusses that in the next section of the book under the heading material blessings that will accompany genuine repentance and this is in chapter 2 verse 18 to 27 in verses 18 to 27 we see that the Lord would be gracious to his repentant people in response to verse 14 remember who knows whether he will not turn and relent there's almost like a time frame between there and it's like no he is going to be gracious to you the emphasis in these verses though is the material blessings that would follow Israel's repentance in these verses God says that he'll take care of Israel's locust problem driving those locusts into the sea you can see that in verse 20 and that even though the land was decimated he would respond would restore prosperity to the land according to verses 19 22 and 24 to 26 brothers and sisters in Christ sometimes we think that God isn't concerned about our physical or material needs we think that that's not important we think you know what God has saved my soul and that's what matters most only my spiritual needs matter and God's not concerned about the other stuff well our spiritual needs are of greater importance than our physical needs let's not deny that but that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about the fact that your body's being ravaged by cancer he does care and that your marriage is falling apart he cares about that too he cares that your boss is abusive that your teenager has a drug problem that you're bullied at school and that you can't find a job or that you can't seem to make friends those things matter to God don't think just because he saved you that you can't come to him with those things God wants you to come to him for these matters as well as for your spiritual needs coming to God for your daily needs doesn't make you unspiritual in fact the opposite is true because going to him for all your needs whether it's physical material or spiritual that actually makes you more spiritual but what spiritual blessings could those who responded rightly to this natural national catastrophe expect that's answered in the next section of the book under the heading spiritual and future blessings that will accompany genuine repentance and this is in chapter 2 verse 28 to 32 and I'm not doing a detailed exegesis on Acts chapter 2 here I'm sticking mainly to the book of Joel and and on what we see here this brings us to the most well-known section of Joel the section quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2 during his Pentecost sermon what we have at the heart of verses 28 to 32 is God guaranteeing the salvation of his people and reminding us that those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved according to verse 32 those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved in these verses Joel looks forward to a day when God's people would be filled with the Holy Spirit in an extraordinary way in a way that was different to what they were currently experiencing the emphasis in verses 28 to 29 is that this future filling of the Holy Spirit this future coming filling of the Holy Spirit wouldn't only happen to people like prophets kings or architects yes architects used to be filled with the Holy Spirit you you can see that in the Pentateuch but instead this filling of the Holy Spirit would be experienced by every single one of the people that called on God because he called on them first you can see that in verse 32 we see that the the fulfillment of this took place in Acts chapter 2 when God ushered in the new covenant and we 
are reassured in verses 30 to 32 that even though the day of the Lord would come in all its frightful power, God would save his people. God would save all the recipients of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you realize what a privilege it is to have the Holy Spirit? That is God himself dwelling within you. When the original readers of Joel read this passage, they saw this as God's blessing par excellence. He said, God will build you a mansion. I'm sorry, I'd rather have the Holy Spirit, God himself dwelling within me. That's better. As I said, God cares about your physical and material well-being, but your spiritual well-being is of far greater importance. To have everything yet remain a slave to sin can destroy your life. Why do you think some of the most miserable people on earth are those that lack nothing? This is the experiential confirmation of Jesus' words in Mark 8, verse 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And you know who comes to my mind as I think of that? Howard Hughes, the famous billionaire known as the aviator. There, there's a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio where he plays Howard Hughes. And in that movie, you see this man, the richest man in the whole world, and he's petrified of germs. And he can't even leave his room. Have you sought happiness in things your entire life? Just to be disappointed again and again. Something brings you satisfaction, but then it just goes away. Something else, then it goes away. Perhaps a time, it is a time in your life where you are to seek spiritual answers as opposed to material answers. Maybe you should be turning to the Holy Spirit inspired Bible and to the person of Jesus Christ. Maybe there you'll find, I can tell you, you will find your answers there. But what would happen to those who refuse to repent. We see this in the next section of the book. The plight of God's enemies, those who refuse to repent. And this is in chapter 3, verse 1 to 16a. What we have in these verses, verse 1 to 16a, is Joel saying, so while God's blessing those who genuinely repent, he'll also execute his frightening judgment on those who wronged his people and were therefore his enemies. He makes his point by using the imagery of all these godless nations gathering in a valley. Why a valley? A valley is a large open piece of land, meaning that a lot of people can gather there. They often had battles in valleys. And they could all gather there to be judged by God. This valley is referred to as the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of Decision. What the prophet is referring to is when a united army of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, they attacked Judah while King Jehoshaphat was on the throne. You can read about this in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22 to 26. This was during the reign of King Jehoshaphat, and the Lord granted Judah victory. Listen to a description of the aftermath of this battle from 2 Chronicles 20, verse 24. And just before I read this, this is King Jehoshaphat's forces are on their way to the battle, and this is what they encounter when they finally get to the place, to the valley where they were meant to have the fight. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked towards the horde, the huge number of people, and behold, there were bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. God had fought Judah's substantial enemy and comprehensively beaten them. And you know what? Judah 
didn't even need to lift a finger. There was, no, there was no such geographical place known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. But any valley where God dealt with the enemies of his people with such efficiency could be called the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of Decision. It's the place where God would judge his enemies by reversing their own sinful behavior right back onto them. You can see this idea of God reversing judgment back on his enemies in chapter 3, verse 4 to 8. If you are still God's enemy, hear verse 14. Verse 14 is an important verse. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What does this mean? Does this mean that you need to make a decision for Jesus? No, it doesn't. That's not what it's saying. This is the valley of decision for God, the divine judge. Here we see the prophet saying, I'm not asking you to accept Jesus, to decide for Jesus. As you just accept him as your Lord and Savior. Instead, I'm telling you, you're in trouble. You better beg God for mercy before it's too late, and then maybe he'll decide, make a decision to accept you. My friend, you still have hope. But repent and trust in Jesus quickly before it's too late. We must get rid of this idea of Jesus waiting on us and pining after us. And us thinking, you know what? I can give Jesus a chance. Jesus is a divine judge that you have wronged. You are not worthy of his mercy, meaning you can offer him nothing. But you know what? If you approach him in humility, if you approach him in a manner that's not like, I'm doing you a favor. I'm accepting you. He may be gracious to you. And you know what? According to John 6, verse 37, those who humbly come to the Lord will be saved. He will accept them. Let's conclude by looking at the final section of the book. Under the heading, the final outcome for those who genuinely Repent. And this is really just a summary of the whole book. We conclude the book in verses 16b to 21, where Joel tells Israel that God is committed to blessing his people. As bad as things may be right now, God's committed to blessing his people by firstly protecting them in the midst of judgment. That's the imagery of a fortress, according to verse 16b. Secondly, by preventing any further foreign invasions. That's God's grace. You can see that in verse 17. Thirdly, by providing for their physical needs. That's in verse 18. God cares about your physical needs. Fourthly, by judging their enemies. In verses 19 and 21, we see this. We see God saying, I will avenge their blood. Blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. He's not going to let injustice take place. It's not the kind of God we serve. And fifthly, by establishing them forever in the promised land. And you see that in verse 20. Let me summarize the book of Joel. And then I'll close. The point of Joel is clear. God uses catastrophes to point us to the reality of future judgment. Let COVID-19 point you to the reality of future judgment. God is coming in judgment, known as the day of the Lord, against his enemy. Whether that be people who claim to know him, but don't know him in reality. You can see that in Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. And he, 
I'm just, I'm paraphrasing. And he said, I do not know you. Or people who just overtly oppose God. Both of those are in trouble. Thirdly, the, the right response. This is the third thing we learn from the book. The right response, if you fall into this category, is to repent of not giving God his rightful place in your life. And what is that rightful place? God needs to be your number one priority. Not number two. He, your whole life needs to be structured around him. Everything. You need to prioritize. You need to put him in the number one position. When you move to a different country, you need to start making decisions like, is there a good church in that area? For some people, that's like, no, that's the last thing I'll think about. No, for a Christian, that's the first thing you think about. Number four, the thing you see in the book, it teaches us, if you respond well to God's call to repentance, which includes trusting in him for deliverance, he's merciful. He often blesses you physically and materially, and that may look different. It may not look like a Ferrari or whatever, but in many cases that is the case. But more importantly, it's great spiritual blessing. And finally, the day of the Lord will no longer be a day of terror to you. That day of the Lord, in fact, will become a day of hope and deliverance instead. See, that's the aspect of the day of the Lord. It's a day of horror for those who don't know Jesus, but it's a day of deliverance and hope for the people of God. Let me end with this. The day of the Lord is coming. Let COVID-19 point you to that fact. What kind of day will it be for you? Will it be the worst day of your life? Or will it be the day of your deliverance? Let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for the book of Joel. Um, there's a lot we can learn from this book. But most of all, Lord, um, we are reminded of the fact that you are a God that judges the wicked, but also that you are a God that is gracious to those who repent and put their faith in you. We pray for every person sitting here. We pray for everyone sitting here, Lord, that when you come in judgment in the future, that that would be a day of hope and deliverance for each one of us and not a day of terror and agony. Please be gracious, Lord. Please do a wonderful work in all of our hearts. Please bring our hearts to rest. We are always in desperate need of your grace. Please help us to respond well to the crises that come our way. Amen.